second part of chapter 56. Ralph had sent a letter to Mr Squeers, carried by Newman Noggs. The interval between the delivery of this message and the arrival of Mr Squeers was very short, but before he came, Ralph had suppressed every sign of emotion and the passionate hatred that he had shown to his nephew. Once more, he had regained the immovable, inflexible manner which was habitual to him and to which, perhaps as ascribable, no small part of the influence which over many men with no strong prejudices on the score of morality, he could exert almost at will. Well, Mr. Squills, he said, welcoming that worthy gentleman with the accustomed smile of which a sharp look and a thoughtful frown were part and parcel. How do you do? Why, sir, said Mr. Squeers, I'm pretty well. So's the family and so's the boys, except for a sort of rash as he's running through the school and puts them off their feed. But it's an ill wind as blows nobody no good. That's what I always say when the lads have a, a visitation. A visitation, sir, is a lot of mortality. And mortality itself, sir, is a visitation. The world is chock full of visitations. And if a boy repines at a visitation and makes you uncomfortable with his noise, he must have his head punched. That's going according to the scripture, that is. Mr. Squills, said Ralph dryly. Sir? We'll avoid these precious morsels of morality, if you please, and talk of business. Oh, with all my heart, sir, rejoined Squeers. But first let me say, first let me, if you please, Noggs. Newman presented himself with the summons, twice or thrice repeated, and asked if the master had called. I did. Go to your dinner and go at once. Do you hear? It ain't time, said Newman doggedly. My time is yours and I say it is, Ralph, to return Ralph. You alter it every day, said Newman. It, it ain't fair. Well, you don't keep too many cooks and you can easily apologise to them for the trouble, retorted Ralph. Be gone, sir. Ralph not only issued this order in his most peremptory manner, but under pretense of fetching some papers from the little office, saw it obeyed, and when Newman had left the little office, chained the door to prevent the possibility of his returning secretly by means of his latch key, opening the street door. Now, I have reason to suspect that fellow, said Ralph, when he returned to his own office. Therefore, I, I, I thought of the, the shortest and least troublesome way of ruining him. I hold it best to keep him at a distance. Wouldn't take much to ruin him, I shouldn't think, said Squeers with a grin. Perhaps not, answered Ralph. Nor to ruin a great many men whom I know. You were going to say? Ralph's summary and matter-of-course way of holding up this example and throwing out the hint that followed it had evidently an effect, as doubtless it was designed to have, upon Mr Squeers, who said after a little hesitation and in a much more subdued tone, Why, uh, what I was going to say, sir, is that this here business regarding of that ungrateful and hard-hearted chap, Snawley Senior. If you remember, Mr. Snawley was the man who impersonated Smike's father. 
and produced a number of papers to back up the fact that Smike was his son. Of course, that was quite fraudulent. The papers did not apply to Smike at all. They applied to somebody else. But that was all part of the plot to try to retrieve Smike from Nicholas. And Squeers, Ralph and Snorley had all been part of it. So speaking of Snorley, Squeers goes on. As I may say, he, he, he puts me out of countenance for weeks together, Mrs Squeers. He'll make her a perfect widow. It's a pleasure to me act to act for you, of course. Of course, said Ralph dryly. Yes, I may say, of course, resumed Mr. Squeers, rubbing his knees. But at the same time, when one comes, as I do now, better than 250 miles to make it, to, 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 to make, make an affidavit, it, 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 it does put a man out of, uh, out a, a, a good deal, uh, letting alone the risk. And what risk should that be? Mr. Squeers, said Ralph. I, I, I said letting alone the, the risk, replied Squeers evasively. And I said, where is the risk? Oh, I, I wasn't complaining, you know, Mr. Nickleby, pleaded Squeers. Upon my word, I, 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 I never know, saw a such... I asked, where is the risk? Repeated Ralph emphatically. Oh, where the risk, returned Squeers, rubbing his knees still harder. Why, it, it ain't necessary to mention it. Certain subjects is, is best avoided. You know what risk I mean. How often have I told you, said Ralph, and how often am I to tell you again that you run no risk? What have you sworn, or what are you asked to swear, but that such and such a time a boy was left with you by the name of Smike? That he was at your school for a number of years, was lost under certain and such circumstances, is now found, and has been identified by you in such and such keeping. Why, well, that's all true, isn't it? Yes, replied Squeers, that's all true. Well then, said Ralph, what risk do you mean? Who answers to a lie but Snorley? Snorley perpetrated the fraud. <laughs> and I paid him much less than I have paid you. He certainly did it cheap, did Snorley observed Squeers. He did it cheap, resorted Ralph testily. Yes, and he did it well and carries it off with a hypocritical look and a sanctified air. But, but you risk, what do you mean by risk? The certificates were all genuine. Snorley did indeed have another son. He has been married twice. His first wife is dead. None but her ghost could tell you that she didn't write that letter. None but Snorley himself can tell you that Smike is not his son, that his son is food for worms. The only perjury is Snorley's, and I fancy he is betty, pretty well used to it. So, where's your risk? Why, you know, said Squeers, fidgeting in his chair, if you come to that, I might say, where's yours? You might say, where's mine? Returned Ralph. You might say, where's mine indeed? I don't appear in the business, neither do you. All Snorley's interest is to stick well to the story he has told. All his risk is to depart from it in the least. Talk of your risk in the conspiracy. I say remonstrated Squeers, looking uneasily round. 
Don't call it a conspiracy, just, just a favour. Oh, call it what you like, said Ralph irritably, but attend to me. This tale was originally fabricated as a means of annoyance against one who hurt your trade and half cuddled you to death, and to enable you to obtain repossession of a half-dead drudge whom you wished to regain would be the best punishment you could inflict upon your enemy. Is that so, Mr. Squeers? Yes, sir, returned Squeers, almost overpowered by the denomination with which Ralph displayed in making everything tell against him, and by his stern, unyielding manner. In a measure, it was. What does that mean? said Ralph. Why, in a measure means, returned Squeers, it, as it may be, that, that, that it wasn't all on my account, because you had some old grudge to, to satisfy too. If I had or not had, said Ralph, do you think I should have helped you? Why, no, I don't suppose you would, Squeers replied. I only wanted the, 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 the point to be all square and straight between us. How can it be otherwise, retorted Ralph, except that the account is against me, for I spent money to gratify my hatred and you pocketed and gratify yours at the same time. You are at least as avaricious as you are re revengeful. So am I. So which is better off, you who win the money and revenge at the same time and by the process, and who are at all events sure of the money, if it's not revenge, or I, who am I only share of spending the money in any case, and can but, but win bare revenge, revenge at last. As Mr. Squeers could only answer this proposition by shrugs and smiles, Ralph bade him be silent and thankful that he was so well off, and then, fixing his eyes steadily upon him, proceeded to say, First, Nicholas had thwarted him in a plan he had formed for the disposal in marriage of a certain young lady and had in the confusion attendant upon her father's sudden death secured that lady herself and borne her off in triumph. Second, that by some will or settlement, certainly by some instrument in writing which must contain the young lady's name and could be therefore easily selected from others, if as access to the place where it had been deposited were once secured, she was entitled to property which, if the existence of this deed ever became known to her, would make her husband, and Ralph represented that Nicholas would be certain to marry her, a rich and prosperous man and a most formidable enemy. And thirdly, that this deed had been with others, stolen from one who had himself obtained or concealed it fraudulently, and who feared to take any steps for its recovery, that he, Ralph, knew the thief. To all this, Mr. Squeers listened with greedy ears that devoured every syllable, and with his one eye and his mouth wide open, marvelling for what special reason he was honoured with so much of Ralph's confidence, and to what it all tended. Now, said Ralph, leaning forward and placing his hand on Squeer's arm. Hear this design which I have conceived, and to which I, I must, I, I, I say, must, if I can ripen it, cause to be carried into execution. No advantage can be reaped from this deed, whatever it is, save by the girl herself or her husband, and the possession of this deed by one or the other of them is indispensable to any advantage being gained. That I have discovered beyond the possibility of a doubt. I want that deed brought here, that I may give the man who brings it fifty pounds in gold and burn it to ashes before his face. Mr. Squeers, after following with his eye the action of Ralph's hand towards the fireplace, 
as if he were at that moment consuming the paper, drew a long breath and said, Yes, but who's to bring it? Nobody, perhaps, for much is to be done before it can be got at, said Ralph. Nobody but you! Mr. Squeer's first tokens of consternation and his flat relinquishment of the task would have staggered most men if they had not immediately occasioned, under the an, an, an utter abandonment of the proposition. On Ralph, they produced not the slightest effect, resuming when the schoolmaster had talked himself out of breath as coolly as if he had never been interrupted, Ralph proceeded to expatiate on the features of the cases he deemed most advisable to lay greatest stress on. These were the age, decrepitude, the weakness of Mrs. Slidescue, the great improbability of her having any accomplice or even acquaintance, taking into account her secluded habits and her long residence in such a house as Grides, the strong reason was to suppose that the robbery was not the result of a concerted plan, otherwise she would have watched an opportunity of carrying off a sum of money. The difficulty she would be placed in would be when she began to think on what was to be done and found herself encumbered with documents of whose nature she was utterly ignorant. The comparative case with which somebody with a full knowledge of her position obtaining access to her and working on her fears if necessary might worm himself into her confidence and obtain under one pretense or another free possession of the deed. To these were added such considerations as the constant residence of Mr Squeers as a long distance from London which rendered his association with Mrs Slidescue a mere masquerading frolic in which nobody was likely to recognise him either at that time or the time afterwards. The impossibility of Ralph's undertaking the task himself, of he being already known to her by sight, and various comments on the uncommon tact and experience of Mr Squeers, which would make his overreaching one old woman a mere matter of child's play and amusement. In addition to these influences and persuasions, Ralph drew, with his utmost skill and power, a very vivid picture of the defeat which Nicholas would sustain should they succeed in linking himself to a beggar in other words, to marry a Madeline who had no money, where he expected to wed an heiress, glanced at the immeasurable importance it must be so of a man situated as Squeers to preserve such a friend as himself, dwelt upon a long train of benefits conferred since their first acquaintance when he had reportedly favourably of his treatment of a sickly boy who had died under his hands and whose death was very convenient to Ralph and his clients, but this he did not say, and finally hinted that fifty pounds might be increased to seventy-five, or even in the event of very great success, even to a hundred. These arguments at length concluded. Mr Squeers crossed his legs, uncrossed them, scratched his head, rubbed his eye, examined the palms of his hands, bit his nails, and after exhibiting many other signs of restlessness and indecision, asked whether one hundred pounds was the highest to which Mr Nickleby might go. Being answered in the affirmative, he became restless again, and after some thought and unsuccessful inquiry, whether couldn't he go to another fifty, said he supposed he must try and do the best, best he could for a friend, which was always his maxim, and therefore he undertook the job. But how are you to get at the woman? That's what puzzles me, said Ralph. Although I may not get at her at all, but I'll try. I have hunted several people in this city before now who have been better hid than she, and I know quarters in which a guinea or two carefully spent will often solve darker riddles than this. I and keep them close too, if need be, 
I hear my man ringing at the door. We may well as well as well part. You had better not come to and fro, but wait till you hear from me. Oh, good, returned Squeers. I say, if you shouldn't find her out, we'll pay expenses at the Saracen, Saracen and, and something for the loss of time. Well, said Ralph testily, you have nothing more to say? Squeers shaking his head, Ralph accompanied him to the street door and, audibly wondering for the edification of Newman, why it was fastened as if it were at night, let him in and Squeers out and returned to his own room. Now, he muttered, come what may, for the present I am firm and unshakable. Let me retrieve this one small portion upon my loss and disgrace. Let me but defeat him in this one hope, dear to his heart as I know it must be. Let me but do this, and it shall be the first link in a chain which I will wind around him as never man forged yet. <laughs> 